But one of the highlights of Kelly S. in West is the, the concept of the destruction of the box. He said that before, architecture enclosed us. But that's not democratic. Architecture should not enclose it. You, you know, it should allow you to experience what you're experiencing on the outside. So that's his concept of destruction of the box. So he opened that space. I'm the manager of public programs here at CIF. We're a nonprofit membership organization dedicated to educating the public about Chicago's rich architectural legacy and future. We do greatly depend on the support of our members to provide a wide array of lectures, youth education programs, tours, and exhibitions. So if you're not currently a member, I do encourage you to sign up today, and we have brochures outlining levels of membership at the back of our lecture hall. Today's program is part of the Lunchtime Lecture Series, which takes place every Wednesday at 12.15. If you'd like to learn more about Frank Lloyd Wright, we do have several tours that might be of interest, including our Frank Lloyd Wright in Oak Park walking tour and two bus tours, Frank Lloyd Wright by bus and our Frank Lloyd Wright neighborhood by bus. And again, all of the dates and times for those are on our website, architecture.org. Today's program, a look at Frank Lloyd Wright's organic principles in the context of today's sustainable initiatives, will be presented by Lyra Luis. Lyra is a global architect holding multiple architectural licenses in multiple countries, the USA and the Philippines. Her first audiobook, titled Frankly Speaking in the Right Way, was written to offer sustainable solutions on the built and natural environment. It chronicles Lyra's life while living at Frank Lloyd Wright's Taliesin including learning experiences and proven and right advice from Mr. Wright's original audio clips. Please join me in welcoming Lyra Louise. Imagine the year was 1932. One man was trying to see something really, really pioneering. We know that in 1932, it was a period of the Great Depression. It was, um, 1932 was from almost on the third year into the Depression, going into that middle of it. Um, as you can see here, as people were lining up for bread, it's probably me over there lining up for bread <laughs> in this current time. But anyway, um, 1932, one man, instead of thinking about the, the realities of the Depression, he had a vision. And what is that vision? He had a vision for an organic architecture that is democratic, right? for an architecture that sympathizes with environment. So he was thinking about organic principles already, even during that time. And today, this is what we have. We are in the recession, and that's me, lining up for hot dogs. So instead of lining up for, probably for bread, people in New York or Chicago are lining up for hot dogs. But you know, all of these, the situation that we are right now, the periods that we are, all of these you know, make us want to think, what did this person do? What was he thinking? What was his, driving, his inner driving force that led him to think about organic principles? So today, we're going to be thinking about the organic, or looking into Franklin Wright's organic principles in the context of today's sustainable initiatives. And specifically, I would point out that it's going to be the LEAD initiative, since this is the most widely accepted benchmarking or rating system that we have right now. Now, let's look at what he had on the drawing table, you know, what he has to offer. I can't begin to describe organic architecture without telling you what Taliesin is about. Taliesin today is known as a collective endeavor that involves probably the foundation, the Franklin Wright Foundation, the Franklin Wright School of Architecture, and you know the, the principles that go with it. But to us, it's actually a way of life, a way of um, a collective way, a form of ideas that allow us to embrace or relate what it is um, that makes us active, that make us relate or live in an environment we are, wherein we are sympathetic with nature. So Taliesin, he got this word from a Welsh word that means shiny brow. And it, uh, this is one of the buildings at Taliesin. This is one of the first buildings that he actually designed. It wasn't intentionally, originally intended for 
Tellies in the campus or Tellies in the 600 acre property in Spring Green or in Tellies in West in Scottsdale, Arizona. This was built for his aunt, um, who actually was a pioneer in the learning by doing school of thought or method of um, teaching. And this was the Hillside Homeschool. Then, of course, we all know the story. I don't know if you've read the book, uh, Loving Frank. He built this house, Taliesin, for Mayma Cheney. But I'm not going to go into detail about you know, Mayma Cheney, the story of Mayma Cheney. I thought I'd just tell that this was built for her. And Taliesin, this marks what Franklin Dwight describes as the shining brow, because Taliesin, the house, was built at the brow of the hill. Then in 1937, Frank Lloyd Wright has a new dynamic wife um, uh, by the name of Algivana Wright. They bought a property in the, in the west side, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona. And that started Tellies in West. So this is Tellies in West, as you can see. He was so inspired by the materials that he found in that desert environment, it's a 600-acre property. Uh, the unique character of the granite, wherein one side was flat, inspired him to create this unique architecture that is now part of the historical landmark. So when they started building this one, that prompted the beginning of the yearly migration that we have, you know, that we still practice at the Franklin Wright School of Architecture, uh, wherein winter times are spent in Arizona, and then to avoid the harsh uh, winters in spring green, that's where they stay, and then to avoid the harsh summers in Arizona, they go back to uh, spring green, Wisconsin. Okay. Learning by doing. I mentioned this, um, that this was the whole concept for learning about the principles of Franklin Wright, which is organic architecture. This centered around apprenticeship, and every single thing that we do, we didn't have classrooms. I lived there for three years, we didn't have classrooms, and it's centered around apprenticeship. And what is this apprenticeship? It's actually the thought that um, based on Tolstoy's idea of what to do. So my program, in the ma I, I got my Master of Architecture degree there, my program centered around what to do. I created my own program. It was unstructured, completely unstructured, but everything I could tell you, it was a living laboratory, it was a living textbook for me because every single thing was an opportunity for unexpected discovery. This is one of the examples of how we learn by doing. We do hands-on construction. And normally, you would have one who is a more, you know, just like in Star Wars, you have, like, before you become a Jedi, you have a master and then the apprentice. So the students learning from the master are called apprentices. I mentioned earlier, Frank Lloyd Wright built Talies in West because he was inspired by the materials that he found in the desert. And this is one example of this one. He created or pioneered this methodology of desert masonry construction, wherein you see here, all these rocks were individually selected by him. And then he incorporated that in a sort of a pattern, like a musical pattern. He would always say that Beethoven, to him, was the best architect. Why? Because he created this sort of rhythm, this unique pattern in his music. So his architecture is in a much similar way. He compares this, that masonry wall into a rhythm, sort of rhythm. And that's really me in the middle. I was doing construction work. That's one of the highlights of my Taliesin experience. We were asked to uh, build that masonry wall to learn what it is, um, you know, knowing and handling the mortars, the, uh, the materials. We would gather all of these granite stones and select which ones that were flat. These were all located or scattered around in the middle of Taliesin West, that 600-acre property. We would gather that for a week, and then another week we would collect sand, also located within the property, and then we would build that masonry wall. It was a test for us for our skills in collaboration. Why did I say it's a test for skill, skills in collaboration? It's because apprentices came from all over the world. We had people coming from China, Japan, Germany, the US, um, Turkey, Philippines, everywhere. And then sometimes these people come in with a limited knowledge or speaking ability of the English language. So imagine building a wall, try building a wall, you know, communicating with these people. 
and then you're trying to follow the original patterns or the original methodology that your forefathers had, had built and matching that with the existing property. So that is what is learning by doing. You learn from all these people, gathering, absorbing like a sponge all of these information. Learning is not limited to, learning is not limited to just, with, uh, just the architecture itself or just the studio. You know, there was a heavy round of pox scrubbing for my part, <laughs> as you can see here. This was during, this is the most appalling photo that, of me that I'm showing you. But um, this was taken during one of the Halloweens. So that's the, you know, the image. But anyway, he, you know, Franklin Wright said that once you work in a kitchen, you'll be able to work in a construction site. And why did he say this? It's because like in a kitchen, imagine this, we are feeding the whole fellowship of about 200 people. And this is just for one meal. You know, you work with a master, which is a chef, an invited chef, you know, every, every day. And then you, you work, you prepare all the ingredients, you cook it, you're, you have a limited time because you have to deliver it at noon or at dinner time. And then, you know, you're limited also with the materials that you have to work with, with the ingredients. And then you have to come up naturally with a good product, otherwise they won't eat it or they will throw it at you. But anyway, that's, that's one of the uh, learning experiences that we have. And in the same way, Franklin Wright, and especially his wife, Olgivana, his dynamic third wife, Olgivana, uh, believe in the multidimensional approach or development of an architect. They believe that they should also be able to relate to different levels of society. So they hold every second Saturday of the month formal events like this to enhance your social skills on a formal setting. They would invite their clients. And this is a tradition that has been continuing on to this day. And also at the same time, you know, after that formal event, we change into our normal clothes and then just hang out. Sometimes we would light a fire in the middle of the desert and create our own bonfire parties. But it's another exercise in, social, in the formal um, social engagement or formal development as a person in a formal setting and also in an informal setting. All in the spirit of learning by doing. So you learn from every single scenario or every single engagement or experience that you have at Taliesin. So let's look at one of the highlights. What is really the focus or the tradition of living at Taliesin West. One of the highlights of my experience living in the desert is living and inheriting a Taliesin shelter. And this continues on to this day. On your first year, you're given a nine by nine square concrete base upon which you would set your canvas tent. So you live like this. This is not a vacation for me. I live like this for a year. So imagine, I mean, you're exposed to the elements. And then if you're lucky on your second year, you'll be given a shelter. Or you could build your own shelter. But what is, what is the meaning of this? Why did we have to do this? These are all exercises in experiencing the elements so that when you go back to the drawing board, you'll be able to adopt all of those back, like say for example, why is Franklin Rice roof leaking? Yeah. So if, if, if this shelter leak, you would know, oh, it's your fault. You have to you know, redesign that one. So what living in my shelter, and I'm going to be showing that in, in, in a few minutes. What living in my shelter, I was looking at what are the important aspects of the site, or my selection for a shelter. Which one should I pick? So I picked the one that had the best views. And this was my shelter. It was a glass shelter. It was glass on three sides, and then this in the middle was a uh, fireplace, and this whole thing, there was only one wall on one side. So it was open to the elements. It was blurring the lines between interior space and exterior space. And I specifically set my bed this way. It was directly pointing outwards, so that when I wake up in the morning, I could see the sunset like shining through the glass and into my face, and I won't even need an alarm clock. I have to, I have to point out though that one story, you know, this is this is what it's like to live in this shelter for two years. You know, at night time, I walk through the harsh desert, you know, with the warm breeze of the harsh desert, and only the sunlight is illuminating my path going to this one. 
So as I picked through the choya, which is the cactus, you know, these are needles with double sides that could grasp you, that could jump at you. As I picked through the choya, I go home to this lightless, heatless environment. And for me, it's an exercise in how can I make this environment livable for me? As you can see here, you know, that's how I would you know, lie down at night and then look over the desert. So it's a direct relation for me being one with nature. And also, it's a direct experience of when one time a deer actually had his head right next to the glass and I woke up and scared the hell out of me because, <laughs> because I thought that the, you know, I completely forgot that there was glass there. The enclosure was to me non-existent. I was just waking up, about to wake up, and then there's this head of the deer poking you know, its head on me and then I thought, I really thought that I was going to be eaten alive. <laughs> that was one of the experiences. But on a more technical side, or on a more organic principle side, what is it about? What, why did I, you know, why did I choose a shelter that didn't have light or didn't have electricity? Because I had no choice of, you know, all of the shelters there didn't have light or electricity and plumbing. But, you know, it's an exercise of analyzing how your environment relates to where you live in. And to me, Imagine in, in Arizona, the summers are really warm, it's three degree, three degree temperature, but the winters are really harsh too. It could go below 30, de uh, not 30, but below 40 degrees. And I didn't have like um, electricity in here. So this wall that I showed earlier acted as a heat sink. It was a direct gain space or direct heat gain for me because this corner was oriented in the west and that, that south that corner was oriented in the south, and we know that in the southern exposure, you, you acquire or you get a lot of heat. So during winter time, when I'm staying here, this whole wall acts as a storage, and it stores that heat, and then releases the heat inside during the nighttime. So I didn't really need to light up the fireplace, or I really didn't need like a heater, a space heater, to keep me warm. So this is a more uh, a zoomed in look into that wall. It's a huge massive wall that was sandblasted, but it does its work of storing that heat in there. All in the spirit of you know, learning or experience learning by doing, and then experiencing what it's like to live in the shelter. Now, one of the other highlights of living in the shelter is daylight. We know that the, the, aside from daylight, the only other source of light that we have in a building is electricity. But I didn't have electricity to work with. So I maximized the use of daylight. And, you know, with the use of the glass, you could see how dramatic the light hits this portion, this, uh, um, I would call it that small living room that I have. And you know that light defines the space. And if you look at this one, how dramatic the light illuminates and produces a very vibrant color on whatever fabric or whatever texture it, it hits on, you know, almost almost in a dramatic way, showing you the texture of what the material is, giving you know, leading your eye to the material. And to frankly write, that's another exercise in organic principles. You know, it has to be true to the nature of the material. Nothing here has been like deteriorating since I lived here. It's still there. If you visit Taliesin West, go on a tour and check it out. The last time I was living in here, the tourists were laughing at me because I had the Ricky Martin poster in one of those corners there. But anyway, again, you know, daylighting. And that was the source of lighting, the only source of lighting that I had for my shelter. And this is another view of that one, allowing the sun, sunlight, or allowing the sunset to illuminate the space. And on a more larger scale, you see how dramatic it is. So this one, this is something that you can't capture. Like if you're, if you're inside, like if you enclose yourself in a building, and you don't have windows, you don't have glazing, and you didn't blur the lines between interior space or exterior space, this is something that you can't capture. It's difficult to capture all in the spirit of learning by doing, or all under Frank Lloyd Wright's um, methodology of learning by doing. 
Now, Frank Lloyd Wright's third dynamic wife, as I mentioned earlier, was, a, was an artist. She was a, a, a dancer. And she believed she was the inspiration behind Frank Lloyd Wright actually starting the Taliesin Fellowship and starting the school. So she encouraged Frank Lloyd Wright to incorporate the different allied arts. These would be the inspiration behind the structure of architecture. And this included um, painting, music, drama, and literature. So all of us, every apprentice who joins the Franklin Wright School of Architecture are required to experience all these divisions of architecture. And when we go look at architecture, some of us think that it's an isolate, isolated thing. If you're studying architecture, you're just studying architecture. You can't be studying painting, photography, drama, literature. But to them, it's a holistic approach. You know, that learning by doing is a holistic approach. You learn or draw inspiration from all these other disciplines in architecture, like painting. You know, you paint your building, you draw your building. This was inspired by, you know, the, the elements in the desert. This was actually one of my studio projects. And the colors, the painting allowed me, was, insp was inspired by the colors that I found in the desert. You'll be surprised if you walk actually through the desert trail, you'll see colors like red, blue, and yellow. I mean, if you look closely, but then if you look, just look at the trail from like a macro view, you won't notice that unless you really pick up a stone and look at it in detail. That's the only time you would see that. And also, piano, playing the piano, that was a big hit for Franklin Wright. And the story was that in the, in the early 30s, when new, the, the school was just starting, Franklin Wright would interview the apprentices and ask, do you play the piano? And if you play the piano, then you're automatically, automatically accepted into the Franklin Wright School. But for me, I, I really played the piano. And during the second Saturday of the month, um, talks or, or formal events that I mentioned earlier, I, I would play, I would give like a mini concert for the whole fellowship. We're also exposed in drama, like this one. Um, we were performing for our country's good. It depends on the, the playwright that they invited, you know, for, for the season. And these are examples of that. And wh why do we do this? Why do we like dress up in costumes, like stupid costumes like this? <laughs> And then act out, you know, in, in that manner. It's all because Franklin Wright believed in the holistic development of an architect. That all of these inspires you to build better architecture. Now, let's look at how all these organic principles are applied in two of his buildings, and also in the sustainable initiatives that I mentioned earlier. Okay, during Franklin Wright's time. When he didn't have his own practice yet, he was apprenticing under um, Louis Sullivan. And four follows function was the slogan of Louis Sullivan. And then Franklin Wright went on and off on his own, and he started form and, he said form and function are one. And this was the fabric or the core of the organic principles. He used nature as his source for design. He defined, he defined organic architecture as nature. It's one that sympathizes with your environment. And he believed that it should be appropriate to time, it should be appropriate to place, it should be appropriate to materials, and it should be appropriate to your environment as well. So like I said, he used nature as a source of design. Even in his uh, pattern, the carpet here, he used patterns on the flowers or the leaves and then incorporated, abstracted that to create a unique pattern for some of these graphic designs. Even the, the, uh, the masonry unit that you saw there, that was inspired by nature. The trees, this is one good example. He identified the column as the branches, and then the, the, you know, the, the leaves or the branches are the ones carrying the roof in much the same way as how this beam carries the roof of the hillside studio in Spring Green, Wisconsin. It was an abstraction of the concept of the branches. You know, it doesn't have leaves right now, but you know, you could see the similarity. Now let's look at one project, the Jacobs House Two, which is known as the Solar Hemicycle House, and how organic principles are incorporated in this one. This is located in um, Wisconsin, built towards the end of World War II, 1944. And this is a best example of applications in organic architecture. If you look at the floor plan here, 
it's oriented, uh, this is north and then that's south. All of this is glazing and that is glazing. You would ask why would anybody put glazing in the middle of Wisconsin when it's so cold outside? It's because it, the, the combination of the curve and the berming here, the berming on this side, allowed this wall and this slab to collect the sunlight during the winter sun when it hits it. And they release that heat during, um, during nighttime. Thereby, they don't really need a fireplace or a heater. They didn't have heater in this house. And that heats up the bedroom at nighttime. This is the berming that I showed you a while ago. And as you can see, you know, from summer to winter, that's how the sun hits this building. And this acts as a direct gain space to heat up the whole building. This is the entrance too. You enter from the north side. It's very cold. You enter from a very cold side, you know, and then as you enter, it actually prepares you. It's like a procession, just like the Unity Temple. It allows you to enter from a very cold space and prepares you to enter a very heated space, all in the concept of organic principles. You're heating it naturally. You're using the form to guide the flow. You're using nature as your element. Now for Taliesin in West, this is located in Scottsdale, Arizona. In the same way, Taliesin in West was built like that. But one of the highlights of Taliesin in West is the, the concept of the destruction of the box. He said that before, architecture enclosed us. But that's not democratic. See here. He said that um, architecture should not enclose it. But you, you know, it should allow you to experience what you're experiencing on the outside. So that's his concept of destruction of the box. So he opened that space. And as you can see here, he opened the, well, right now there's like a, a blind there, but originally there was no blind there. But you know, this is the interior of that studio that we just saw. Daylight illuminates the space. And we hardly use any of the fluorescent lights during the day. And even during the, you know, even during like early, early evening, we hardly use any electricity just to light up our workspaces. But of course, it won't be a Franklin Wright building unless it leaks. It does leak, so like, as you can see, we, are, we cover the whole our desk with like garbage bags so that during the monsoon, it won't uh, damage whatever projects that we were working on. But I mean, it's still, it's still a Franklin Wright building. But I am showing you the realities of it. So comparing the two from where I lived in a shelter and comparing the Jacob's house, both of them applied the organic principles of Frankl, like you know, using nature to guide the flow, using nature as an advantage, and then complementing that with your existing space. So you can see here, this is a direct gain um, wall, and that was a direct gain wall. Now let's look at LEED, which is our current sustainable initiative. LEED has seven subject areas that are you know, being you know, incorporated right now that these are the criteria that you have to meet in order to attain a certain level of, um, uh, of award, it, be it like certified, you know, seven, the seven topics, be it uh, lead certified, silver, gold, or platinum. But anyway, these are just the benchmarks, and I want to show you a comparison between the two, the organic principles and what we have as lead. So, and, and then how it relates to or how we could apply that even in our lives, not necessarily on your projects. The first one would be the sustainable sites. I'm not going to go into detail about LEED because that's really highly technical and I'm really not, um, I'm, although I'm a LEED accredited professional, but we want to focus only on the major parts of the LEED so that you won't get bored. But sustainable sites, um, it, it's really maximizing the site area that you have, you're making sure that you're preserving wildlife and habitat, the open spaces that you have, and using, um, making sure alternative transportation is available, and most of all, encouraging people to bike or using fuel efficient uh, cars in order to transport you from one place to the other, preserving the open spaces of a given site, and then also you know, minimizing light pollution. Another subject of lead is water efficiency. It's essentially you know, not using potable water for low grade uses. And what, what is it, you know, what, how does that affect us? It's, you know, it's preserving the water just like what we have right now. There's like an oil spill. So I think that's a damage, you know, that's another subject area. 
Um, you know, we want to capture, LEED encourages to capture rainwater. And instead of, you know, I've seen like very ugly uh, cisterns. I saw this really very sexy design of a um, rainwater, <laughs> uh, for capturing rainwater. And then of course the flush, the low flow flush that you have. Another subject that they um, tackle is energy and atmosphere. It's essentially making sure that your equipments are uh, installed, calibrated, and operating according to the owner's uh, basis of design and uh, the owner's intent. And essentially making sure that it's utilizing green power. And they have elements like, you know, they give you points if you get, uh, if you use green power via photovoltaics or the, um, the windmills. So that's energy and atmosphere for you. I don't know if, you know, that how applicable this one is in a smaller project, but in the same way, you could get points for it. Another one is materials and resources. It essentially tells you, you know, to minimize waste so that it doesn't contribute even further to landfill. So that's one of, uh, one of the subject matters that LEED is actually tackling on. And I think for us, it's very important. So, um, I saw one of these actually at the Millennium Park and I thought this was very efficient because you know, it's a, it's a trash bin wherein it's also operated on a solar or photovoltaic system where it compacts it so that the collector only comes maybe like once a month. So, so that's you know, essentially very interesting for me too. Another aspect of that need is indoor environmental quality. Is your space like very healthy for you to live in? Do you get allergies when you live in your space or when you live in your home? It's making sure that the, the amount of, you get the amount of fresh air that you need or the ventilation that you need in a space. So that for you is indoor environmental quality. It also includes ideas about daylighting. And then views, by the way, this was from last night, so I don't know the fireworks happening, somebody was filming. But you know, that view is also incorporated in LEED. And also using filters to make sure that you're using the correct filters in your home so you minimize and, you know, that allergies that you have during springtime. And lastly, also LEED also gives you points when you innovate in a specific design. Although I don't know how you innovate because if, if you're a LEED accredited professional, you automatically get one point in your LEED <laughs> ranking. So, but you know, it allows you for that. One last thing that they added is regional priority. As you can see, this is actually a zip code. And this is interesting because they set a specific point for you to achieve if you're in a given uh, zip code. Like say here, uh, in the loop area, there's a specific number of important ideas that you get. You could get like this in the Santa Fe building. I'm assuming a zip code of 60601. So they said that um, the, the unique element of this building situated in this area applies to say public, transporta public transportation access. And it's true. Now let's look at organic principles, the ones that I showed you earlier, and then lead side by side. How do they compare? And you know, how do how do they apply in today's technology or in, in our day-to-day -day lives? Okay, we'll um, we'll do a side-by-side -side analysis, and I'm going to take you back to the Jacobs House um, stormwater design, for example. Uh, the Jacobs House is a sunken garden that naturally diverts water away from the building, and then this was berming, as I've shown you earlier in the building. So it actually diverts and controls flooding. So the sustainable site controls um, uh, the quality and the quantity of runoff. Now maximize open space. Again, under for, sus for the lead, it's under sustainable sites. At Taliesin, this is a map of Spring Green, Wisconsin, it, we maximize the whole space and also actually incorporate a garden that we now call the Taliesin Organic Farm. And then for prairie, you know, using the prairie as a natural landscape, this is a view of Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin. And this is LEED, Water Efficient Landscaping. They say to minimize your use of water. Franklin Wright utilized the Wisconsin River for, for all the landscaping, you know, to, to, for the irrigation basically of the landscaping there. Now, for green power, going back to that Jacob's house, we didn't really need electricity or heating because this is a direct gain space. And then for lead, you get points for using the windmill or um, the wind, the power of the wind 
to utilize electricity. Materials and resources. Franklin Wright used the stones, these stones that were located in that property for the Jacobs house. So it was located within the region. There was no need to deliver them. And for lead, you get materials and resource points if you actually buy materials that are located locally. And then daylighting. And then for lead, indoor environmental quality. Natural daylight, you know, is within the element of this Jacobs house, as you can see. The whole glazing floods the space with light. And for lead, it gives you a point if you just install, let's like, say, a skylight on your roof. And then views. Again, this was the view from last night's fireworks. You know, you get a point for indoor environmental quality in lead if you pro provide views to your space. Franklin Wright, as I mentioned, provided a lot of these extensive views overlooking the sun sunken garden on that Jacobs house. Thermal comfort for lead, you get another point for that. For Franklin Wright, he used nature to guide the flow. He used nature, you know, the natural elements of the site to actually bring about thermal comfort for the spaces or for the houses he designed for his clients. So this burning stores all that heat. Innovation in design. Franklin Wright pioneered the mitered window. He believed that the best place of a column is not at the corner, not here, but inset on the side so that the person viewing the outside can see it clearly without any, any column blocking their view. Regional priority, as you can see, even the bird, like Franklin writes a, a, cat, a bird walk over there, they tweet about it, but you know, that's, that's regional priority. You know, this building is appropriate to time and place. It's regional, it's appropriate to the location in Spring Green, Wisconsin. So that's, yeah, that's this uh, organic principle side by side. Now let's look at how this applies in our daily life. By the way, all of these information will be available at, um, you know, you could email me, you could Twitter me, or you could get LinkedIn with me, but that would be available for you. So let's look at how this applies to us. Okay, we saw already the garden, and then this is how I applied it in my, in my work. Uh, this utilized, it's one of my projects in Phoenix, Arizona, and utilized sun shading, and then minimizing the extensive you know, need for any heating during summertime in Arizona. But you know, just, so you, just so you could see, all of these play an important role in all of the organic principles that I've learned while living at Taliesin. This was my first home at, um, in Phoenix, Arizona. It's one of the case study houses. It was a call for um, uh, affordable housing that was uh, is started by John Intensa in 1944. And I utilized the interior, oops, I utilized the interior, blurring the lines between interior and exterior, basing it off of what I learned by living in the desert. So that was my living room, and that's how I applied it. How can you apply it? Um, I saw in your own lives. I saw this one uh, last weekend during the Green Festival. And basically, they're making a point that they said that if you're taking a shower, it takes about 30 gallons um, for a five minute shower, which is equal to feeding and uh, caring for one cow. So that's the comparison. So maybe you would want to shower less or buy a cow. I don't know. <laughs> and then maybe perhaps you could walk to work, you know, incorporating all of these. And then when you go back to your desk, you know, go back to work today, you could probably just use a task light instead of illuminating the, your whole space. And then you can also eat local and eat seasonal, seasonal uh, um, food. And then when you buy your food, use canvas bags as well. And then you know, instead of driving, you could just bike to work. And lastly, when you go home tonight, make sure that your lights are fluorescent. And also, when you sleep, you could also dream about sustainability. <laughs> See, dream about sustainability. And all of these, you know, in, in the end, I should probably start here. Yeah. All of these tell you what organic principles are today you know, compared to the, today's sustainable initiatives. Thank you.
which is located in Taliesin yes, Street Green. We're renovating one of the barn houses there, and then we're applying for LEED certification. We're trying to achieve LEED certification. It's an original apprentice right building, but we're updating it as well and then trying to get LEED certified. Yes? The LEED takeoff point, if the glass ceiling leaks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe uh, it's an innovation in design. Maybe somebody could just cock it. You know, could innovation in design. Yes? How come, uh, I mean, your exception, I mean, he does have a school, but the Frank Lloyd Wright School never never became as big as, say, uh, uh, Mies van der Rohe. The Bauhaus? Could you repeat the question, please? He was asking how come the Frank Lloyd Wright School of Architecture did not grow as big as, say, Lee Sander or Walter Bowlby's Bauhaus to that effect. Well, um, the Franklin Red School of Architecture, even during Franklin Red's time, their intent, the business model for the school was to only accept a maximum of 35 students per year because 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 the learning is not structured. It's one on one. You learn, you, you apprentice. You, that was your basis for studies. So you have a one. Again, you need to have a one on one experience or relationship with your mentor. If it's a school setting, I mean, if it's bigger, then they would have to bring in a lot of faculty. But the, you know, I have, to, I have to say, I'm proud to say that the school has been operating at an extremely low budget since Franklin Bright started it. And then they come up with two really grand buildings that are part of the historic registry. But the tradition continues on. They only accept a maximum of 35 students per year. OK, with that, I thank you for coming. This program is partially supported by a grant from the Illinois Arts Council, a state agency.